Welcome to this rapid review on the velocity of money and money demand equations. And we'll start off by reviewing the definition of the velocity of money. So V, the velocity of money, is defined as the average number of times uh, a dollar in the money supply is used per time period. And if we reflect on that for a bit, we think, okay, well, then that would be the total amount spent, nominal expenditure, which we know is measured by the nominal GDP, divided by the money supply. So total amount of dollars spent divided by number of dollars in the money supply gives you average number of times each dollar is used. But no one really likes this form of the equation. What they like to do is rearrange this into the most common form, uh, which is called uh, the quantity equation, or more, gen or more often mv equals py. So rearrange to mv equals py. And this equation is basically just a definition of velocity, but more commonly it's called the quantity equation. All right, so now that we've reviewed velocity, let's talk a little about money demand. When you think about money demand, sometimes it's um, tempting to think of this as demand for, you know, I want money because I want to be rich. And that's really not what this is about. This is about demand for money as opposed to other stores of value, as opposed to other assets. So. If you had lots of bonds, you would be rich. If you had lots of money, you would be rich. If you had lots of houses, you would be rich. Uh, this is about why would you want to have money as opposed to bonds or houses or some other asset. And what makes money special is that you can use it for transactions. So we tend to think as a first pass, the money demand is going to be high when you need to do a lot of transactions. You need to spend a lot. And we know expenditure is P times Y or at least expenditure in a year, is PY, nominal GDP. So we figure money demand is probably proportional to expenditure. So we would say it's a simple money demand function would be some proportionality constant K times expenditure PY. And um, for whatever reason, historically, economists don't like to write it in this form. Instead of focusing on money demand, they focus on real money demand. So that would be money demand divided by the price level to get you the, the real value of the money. And then the P's on the right side would cancel. So economists would write this as MP demand, real money balance demand, is proportional to real GDP. So this is real money balance demand. And this is a perfectly fine equation as far as things go, but it's definitely simple. It's saying there's only one factor that matters for money demand, that's real GDP, and everything else is irrelevant. And we know that's probably too simplistic. There's probably other factors that matter. And there's one in particular we'd like to uh, generalize and include. So let's go ahead and do that. Probably the most important factor we've left out is the what we could think of as the opportunity cost of holding money. If you hold money as opposed to those other assets we talked about earlier, like bonds or stocks, what you miss out on is interest. So presumably you would want to hold less money the higher the interest rate gets. And we'd like our money demand equation to, to reflect that. So the traditional notation is we say money demand is a function of that nominal interest that's like a, the penalty for holding money. It's the opportunity cost of holding money. And of course, real GDP like before. And a way of writing this to sort of summarize how these variables relate to money demand is to put a minus sign below i to show that they're negative, negatively related and a plus sign below y to show that they're positively related. So just as a note, this notation indicates that as i goes up, as nominal interest rates go up, then you're not going to want to hold as much money because you're missing out on all that interest by holding money, so you won't want to do it. So as I goes up, uh, money demand, or L, goes down. And by the way, sometimes people ask, why do we use L here? It's because money's liquid. So in some sense, you could think of money demand as demand for liquidity. It's a preference for liquidity. And it turns out liquidity preference is, a, is the name of an important theory for short run, or part of an important theory for short run fluctuations we'll study later this semester. All right. One last reminder is that sometimes we don't like to work with the nominal interest rate directly. So if you remember from the Fisher equation, the nominal interest rate is the x anti nominal interest rate is the real interest rate plus expected inflation. So often we'll be working with the real interest rate and expected inflation instead of with nominal interest directly. And we'll see that in the next example. 
So here we have an example of money demand is 0.1y over i squared. As expected, as y goes up, money demand goes up. As i goes up, money demand goes down. So this sort of fits with what we've been talking about. And the first question asks us, find an expression for v. So we've got to go back and think. On the previous slide, we defined velocity. It was py over m. Or alternatively, you could think of this as it's y over m over p, right? And if you need to pause the video and verify that, that that algebra works out, that these are just two ways of saying the same thing. All right, so now we can plug in for m over p. We have real money demand, and real money demand in equilibrium will equal real money supply. So we'll plug in. We have y divided by 0.1y divided by i squared. The y's cancel. So we get 1 over 0.1i squared. And then when you divide by a fraction, you sort of multiply by the reciprocal. So hopefully you remember this is going to work out to being uh, 10i squared. Great. So we've got an expression for velocity. It's 10 times the nominal interest rate squared. We don't know the nominal interest rate, so we can't actually get a number here. And that's why it says find an expression for v as opposed to find a number or calculate v. The next part is going to give us some more information, and now we can actually calculate velocity. So what is the velocity of money if the real interest rate is 8% and expected inflation is 2%? And you might ask, well, why are they giving us the real interest rate? We know that velocity from part one, we know that velocity depends, depends on the nominal interest rate. But for that part, we've got to go back and remember our Fisher equation up here connects nominal and real interest. So this is kind of testing your understanding of the Fisher effect and your understanding of velocity and money demand. <laughs> so our starting point is to notice r is 8%, which means we want to plug in 0 0.08 for r. Sometimes we will plug in 8, and then you'll get you know, a number that's like different by often two orders of magnitude or more. Um, so you don't want to make that mistake. And we have expected inflation is 2%. So that means expected inflation is 0.02. All right, so we know velocity is equal to 10 times i squared, and i is r plus expected inflation. So we can plug that in, 0 0.08 plus 0 0.02 squared. And we'll sort of combine terms, we get 10 over 0 0.1 squared. And then 0 0.1 squared is 0 0.01, so we get 10 times 0 0.01. That's 10 times 1 one hundredth, so 0 0.1. So velocity is 0 0.1. That's actually really low for velocity. The um, M1 velocity of money in the U.S. I think is, is more like 10 to 20. Fluctuates quite a bit in recent years. So this is not exactly like realistic for an economy, but it's a nice example to work through to just get practice calculating with money demand. And we're going to see a lot of money demand uh, both in the long run and the short run throughout the course. Thanks for watching.